Hi everyone! This is going to be a special weekend of Jimi Hendrix. Well, actually, we don't even know yet if we can manage to do this on YouTube. So, we're going to try, and if for some reason YouTube doesn't allow it, then we will publish excerpts there and we'll find the full thing on Coffee and Patreon. So, that's just to let you know what we are attempting to do this weekend. And actually Vlad tells me that this is um, kind of a little taste of a bigger Jimi Hendrix event that he's planning and he doesn't want to tell me all the details yet so that means you don't get to know the details yet but you can keep your eyes open for some other Jimi Hendrix project coming up in the near future. Having said that, Let's see what there is to read about this and what I have to learn and then we'll listen. Voodoo Child, Slight Return, is a song written by Jimi Hendrix and recorded by the Jimi Hendrix Experience in 1968 that appears as the final track on the group's third studio album, Electric Ladyland, released that year. Now I should say right here that I have listened to one Jimi Hendrix song before and you'll find that somewhere on Coffee, Patreon, perhaps excerpts on the YouTube channel, and that was Purple Haze, so you can check that out if you want. This song is one of Hendrix's best known. It was a feature of his concert performances throughout his career, and several live renditions were recorded and released on later albums. After his death in 1970, Track Records released the song as a single in the United Kingdom using the title Voodoo Child. No. Voodoo Child. It became Hendrix's only number one single on the UK singles chart, reaching the top position during the week of November 15, 1970. Rolling Stone magazine included it at number 101 on their original 2004 list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. I had to look at that for a moment because I was expecting it to be a list of 100 greatest or something and I saw 101. No, 500 greatest songs of all time. Joe Satriani said of the song, It's just the greatest piece of electric guitar work ever recorded. In fact, the whole song could be considered the holy grail of guitar expression and technique. It is a beacon of humanity. Oh, that sounds pretty complimentary. I guess I should be paying attention to the guitar today. Author Charles Shar Murray examines Hendrick's use of the term voodoo child in his book Crosstown Traffic, saying, Voodoo symbolism and reference resound through the country blues and through the urbanized electric country blues of the Chicago school. In Hendrix's case, this is pure metaphor. He certainly was not a voodoo initiate in any formal sense. Okay, well, this has me curious. What is it about the guitar that makes it the greatest piece and a beacon of humanity? Let's find out.
I've ever heard a guitar sound quite like this and as I'm of course with the little introduction I read I I have my attention focused on the guitar and I'm trying to take it all in and and wrap my mind around it wrap myself around it and it's so interesting because it sounds rather virtuosic in a way but if I were being asked to describe the guitar playing, I guess I wouldn't use that term because I would be afraid that it would give the idea that it's a showmanship piece, that it's that it's focusing on on demonstrating the technical prowess. And I don't feel that in this music. I don't feel like it's about the technical prowess, although as as ignorant as I am about the techniques, the actual playing experience and what's hard and what's easy on a guitar, I feel like this is really quite technically adept. Um, in that regard, in that sense, in that way, it makes me think of something like the Bach cello suites because those again are incredibly technically demanding in fact they're or or we could say if we're going to relate it to keyboard works we could say the the Bach preludes and fugues the 48 or um some of I, I'm going towards Bach why why am I going towards Bach it's because it's because there's an incredible necessity for technical mastery, but it's not for the purpose of displaying technical prowess. It's, it's, about, it's about the expression. And there's an incredible depth of soul, we could say, to that music. And musicians have said for decades, centuries even, that they could study Bach for their entire life and never get to the bottom of it. Um, you know, Pablo Casals was famous for playing, for starting every single day at, at his cello practicing Bach. And I feel like the same thing is happening here with this, with this guitar piece. I mean, I recognize that it's technically incredibly demanding, but there's something about the the depth of soul to it, the the expression, the what it carries within it, that could keep a musician occupied for days, weeks, months, years, perhaps. I'm thinking, I'm not a guitarist, I'm not a violinist, but. If I were to try to play this on the harp or piano and really do it justice, I would be spending a long time living with this music because it does have a lot of substance to it, emotional substance. And, and the best expression I can think of is to, is to call it musical soul. And that's, that's why I'm just sitting here listening as I'm going through. Should I stop it? Should I keep going? How, how is this? Because, because there's so much there, even though, like Bach, it builds off of some very small bits of musical thematic material. Call it riffs, call it themes, call it subject matter, whatever. But it's the way it's handled and, and what comes out of it. All right, let's keep going.
where it's 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 a lot of fast finger work and there's a lot of subtle shading and coloring of of the notes as it goes there's something about it that's to me painfully beautiful it it seems to just get into my the core of me <laughs> Timeless about it. Wow. And and I didn't really apologize for the ending either. It was as if at the introduction, he said, all right, hold on to your seat because we are going to be going for a ride and I'm taking charge. You don't have any, any say in the matter. And we we're taken through this fabulous, fabulous experience. And then, then at the end, you hear him coming to an end. It's not like it just cuts off abruptly, but there's no apology about it. It says, all right, take it or leave it, love it or hate it. Um, I gave it to you. And I guess I feel like there's something incredibly authoritative about the delivery. Um, that's why I think of this no apology at the ending. This is going to be a piece that I have to return to. You will. I'm sure I will. I can't actually imagine myself putting this on in the background and and letting it be background music. And um, I think it would become annoying. I think I would find it irritating and distracting. It's the kind of piece that for me, I feel like I will want to sit and listen deeply to it, to give it attention. There's a lot of music that I relate to that way. Not just in the rock genre, but a lot of classical music. In fact, a lot of Bach, Beethoven, um, some of the other really substantive composers. Um, they have this way of turning out music that really, if you put it in the background, it feels like chaos. You can't, you can't really get into it because it's like some, well, imagine some intellectual, philosophical conversation that is deep and complex. And you're, you're trying to listen to it while you're, while you're driving or while you're even worse, even worse, let's, let's forget about driving because you can actually concentrate while driving. Let's think about what if you're, what if you're trying to study um, a different subject while that is going on. It doesn't work. It, it's, it's too distracting. You have you too much going on, at least for me. Maybe for somebody with more brain power, but I think those people are rather rare in this world. <laughs> That's how I feel about this one. And it's, it's interesting to have this kind of experience, listening experience, with a piece of electric guitar music, for one, an instrument that I've only, in the past year, come to really appreciate and perhaps even love, depending on who's playing it. And um, as well as find it in 
the rock genre, which of course is known for having a lot of short, quick, catchy tunes, right? I'm in the middle of the Beatles project and I've kind of gotten used to the two minute, three minute little song where you can sing along and have fun all the way through and they're great, they're fabulous, but this is a different kind of musical experience, at least for me. It's the Jimi Hendrix experience. The Jimi Hendrix experience, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Now, of course, saying that this is not a piece of music that I imagine myself listening to in the background doesn't mean that something that I could listen to in the background would be less substantive, um, have less musical content, emotional expression. It's just different and different kinds of music work for me one way or the other. Uh, take take Brian May, for instance. His, his guitar playing is unique as well, and it's incredibly expressive and incredibly sophisticated and musical and, and gorgeous. But what he presents musically is presented in a way that is... It carries easier... The melodies are, are easier to follow and, and the rhythms, I mean, it, it's kind of a subjective thing and I, I think it's personal for every single one of us, but, but I could listen to Brian May in the background much more easily than I could listen to this voodoo child in the background. Perhaps it also has to do with the point at which I am in my experience of the guitar because this clearly uses a lot more of the gritty sounds and it's um, less melodic, it doesn't have such sustained melodies, and so it requires me to dig in it a bit more to really appreciate it. And yet I cannot write it off as just noise or something like that because it, it isn't. It's clearly something that has a lot of artistic expression and and content. So that's that's kind of the balance between would it be background music? Would it not be background music? Why isn't it background music for me? Maybe it would change at some point in the future. It's possible. But I do plan to return to this one and explore it some more orally, emotionally, um, musically, because there is something incredibly deep and beautiful about it. I like the way that it he he always returns to this bomb da dee dum bomb bomb da dee dum, and he uses that kind of as his base of the whole piece, and then he takes ideas from that and he he digresses from that, he extrapolates that, he he carries it higher, or he modifies it, but then he always returns to that. And it's less about... The other thing that I wanted to say is this idea of it being, having a lot of musical content. It's less about the specific notes. It's more about what he's doing with them how he's shaping them. So if I were to sit and draw on the page and say these notes are so incredible and these notes, it would mean absolutely nothing because this piece isn't... that's not the thing that makes it be incredible. What makes it be incredible is the way he handles each of the notes, the way he carries us from one to the next, the way he shapes and colors the the tones and the the phrases and and how he manipulates the music and that is where the real artistry and musical substance is and that's why I say I need to return to this several times to really get into and appreciate and become familiar with what he's doing because I see that it's really masterful incredibly beautiful in its own way, and, shall I say, worthy of study. So, 
Well, what a surprise. Voodoo Child. Um, or, as it was released in UK, Voodoo Child. Interesting experience for me. I don't know what the other one is going to be, but we'll have another one this weekend, and we'll find out pretty quick. I'll see you soon.